So the the framework for yeah, like okay, talking about where we are right now. Um, you know, how does this work? So we've been at it for a long time, and how how long have you been following this work? I think I saw your TED talk probably in 2013. Okay. Um, and then I, I just I had some inventions uh, over the years that um, I kind of let into the public domain, and I figured, you know, there's I couldn't patent them. That so uh, what what could I do with them? And then I start started to think, well, maybe maybe you would be interested in them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's talk about. Um, but ideas, yeah. I mean, we've got a lot of different stuff and being busy like the thing is it's uh, this time around it's about product release so we're working on a cd go home as the main release that we we aim to scale the project from that but um i mean yeah maybe you can let's see what what uh how we can go about this because it's really about kind of the tech transfer part and business development that's where we're at right now yeah so perfect i mean it's uh, we just met some people i don't know if you ever ran into jesse bowden from umkc he does their tech transfer there at, at the Missouri Center for Defense and Energy. So that's a recent, very recent contact since the apprenticeship. Uh, one of the people that in the sounds, yeah, he sounds familiar. Yeah. Um, so so we're on this this game of yeah trying to develop the enterprise, also uh, trying to set up the our operation for GI Bill acceptance for education and apprenticeship. So that's kind of where we are. We're running an apprenticeship where we're training people right now to build a house and otherwise trying to get the uh, solid business model around that but also around the supporting machines like the tractor the 3d printing we're, we're quite excited about the large-scale 3d printers and plastic recycling infrastructures for uh, factory for construction materials because we see that that could be a great uh, cost reducer as well for all kinds of com complex geometry so just playing plain plastic but us actually also solving the plastic issue as in um, re reclaiming all types of plastic because right now the the state of art in the open source or closed source you can't do you can't do recycling with 3d printers for various reasons and we're trying to crack that that puzzle and that is large printers high temperature chambers so large printers high temperature chambers definitely do not exist in a in an open source and they don't even exist i haven't really seen uh, the kind of large scale we're talking about because we're talking about actually four by four by eight foot heated chambers meaning hot, 170, 180, um, using very basic, I mean, not infringing into any patents, we've got a simpler way to do it, very simple. Yeah. I think I think this is gonna, this is gonna work. So we'll see. So this, is, this is for making filament for 3D printers? Yeah. So Why do you need to heat so much at once? Otherwise you can't print with anything outside of very easy to print plastics. Uh, so if you have any higher temperature plastics that are really sensitive to temperature gradients, the thing just does delaminates and you can't print with it. You can't print with common plastics right now. You can't print with polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, this, the most abundant plastics. You can't. They're too hard to print with uh, unless yeah. you get into the high temperature chambers. Um, so I, I had been living in Portland and they have a mini maker fair and there were some people making their own filament there mm -hmm. um i think it was mostly out of like yogurt um containers mm -hmm. so i don't i don't know what that material is um but i think they were maybe kind of cutting it up and then make using it kind of like a hopper yeah. and then extruding filament uh i don't know how good uh, was that filament it was. where oregon oregon yeah uh that oregon. must have been um where it's a part of fused particles, not it wasn't filament. It was actual shred that was printing. I know the guy. If that's oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't remember. It's been it's been a few years. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway. I, I feel like I I I've, I've learned a decent amount about you from your website. Uh, uh, I maybe I should introduce myself a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so I I. I, I Got my PhD in mechanical engineering yeah. in 2013. Uh, then went to work for Intel mm -hmm. in in Oregon yeah. um, in their logic technology development group. Um, wasn't so much at development. It was mostly babysitting a really expensive machine and um, trying to keep it maintained 
uh, make sure it, uh, it wasn't producing particles and was making thin films uh, within a tight tolerance. Uh -huh. Which uh, I know it sounds really exciting, but it, it really wasn't for six years. So um, <laughs> then I, I've been wanting to come back to music. Uh, I got in their tech transfer office uh, started January of last year. Yeah. And uh, it's it's pretty interesting. Um, I, I help. I'm, I've just recently started helping companies. <coughs> Sorry, you cut out there. I'm back. Okay, you're back. Yeah. Okay. So, Sorry, my internet's uh, maybe not not doing great. Yeah. So you started. Uh, that was last year. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the tech transfer office, and uh, I've just been recently trying to help startups from the zoo uh, get like SBIR funding, NSF oh, yeah. funding. Oh yeah. Um, and then, and then my my yeah, like I said, my mother-in-law, she works for SBDC. Um, helping companies get yeah. get grant funding, PPP loans recently, you know. How'd you get into the, so uh, like, are you savvy in the, in the enterprise side or how'd you learn, learn that? How'd you go from the tech to the enterprise? Um, you know, I've always kind of had an entrepreneurial spirit, but never, never thought of uh, a good enough idea that I was going to jump in and then, uh, uh, I listen a lot to uh, this show, this podcast called Econ Talk. Mm -hmm. um, so that got me really interested in you know, economics and um, and I don't know how I got into learning about like open source and crowdsourcing, um, but uh, you know I, all these inventions I I, I had uh, none of them. I, I could really do myself. Um, I I don't have a background in like three D printing. I just kind of self taught, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you looked at any of the things I've made. Haven't got a uh, chance to do that yet. Yeah, so like one of the things I, I showed at, at the Portland Maker Fair mm -hmm. was a uh, very large um, foam cutter. So oh, yeah. it was. Have you seen the polar graph um, drawing robots? It's got stepper motors in the corners um, and pulleys in the middle. They, they have like a pen, so you can use it as a pen plotter. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a, there's a company that made a CNC just like that um, called, uh, it, it was Maslow CNC, now it's Maker Made. I see, yep. Um, oh, those, yep. Yeah, I had that guy over uh, Bar Smith over for dinner in Portland. Oh, cool. He happened to live in the same town, um, but mine was basically two of those, and instead of a pen, uh, it was two plates with holes in them, and uh, a hot wire um, spanned between the two holes, and so you could cut three-dimensional shapes out out of the foam. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was another one. Uh, wind turbine this wind turbine it, it uh when the wind is uh going towards you the the flaps close it pushes these flaps closed um it's a vertical axis wind turbine mm -hmm. and as it rotates around um so that the uh, the flaps are going towards the wind the flaps open uh, the wind causes it to, to open and so it, it's only uh, it's rotating, uh, it's only having resistance in one direction, the direction you want it to turn. Um, but those things are, you know, outside of my area of expertise, and, and I didn't want to spend a lot of money uh, developing them, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. paying people. I, I figured if I, if I got, if I, um, if I just did it as open source, yeah. then then somebody, then there's a free rider problem that somebody could just take every all the work that I've done, copy it, and produce it themselves. You know, so I I was hesitant to 
to just put it out there. Um, although most of it I put out on like hack a day. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, so you probably haven't had a chance to, to read my couple articles on uh, crowdsourced cooperatives. I haven't read, read, uh, do you want to summarize or? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I can. And, uh, so it, it basically, uh, you know, kind of open source to, to make a, an employee owned company. Uh, but more than just employee owned, uh, that it's a company would be uh, kind of democratized so that people can vote um, how much ownership uh, other people deserve uh, based on their contribution. Mm -hmm. And then also mm -hmm. the people within the company can vote on how they should solve the problems, you know, what products they should make, how, how to solve those problems, how to make those products. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the more you contribute, the more the more uh, power you have, the more voting power you have. Mm -hmm. um, but that way, there's an incentive to continue helping with the business. That that way, there's an incentive to to um, uh, you know, you sh there's there's still the the uh, the mechanism, the profit mechanism is there. Um, you know, less worry about the free rider problem. It's another good way to get experts to work on their expertise. You know, some companies, like at Intel, um, they hire a bunch of PhDs in, in science that don't necessarily know anything about software, and the, the company would have software needs and so the, the engineers would, would write, write the software for them. And it would be awful software. And it would take a long time to, to, uh, to make, wouldn't work well, would break down, um, and the engineer would leave, and so then nobody would keep it uh, main, maintained. So uh, another reason why you would have a company like this is that, you know, let's say, you, you can only do a very small thing. You're, you are the expert in that thing. So then it ins you, you could easily uh, set it up so that people make money to do the things that they're good at. And if they're not good at it, don't waste time paying them like a normal job would um, to just, you know, fill a seat. So, because I, I, feel, I felt like I... I wasn't an expert a lot of the times at, in the things I was doing at Intel, but they just needed somebody and they, they needed to keep me busy because, yeah. you know, they hired me. And I was fine with acting like I was uh, worth that money, right? But I, I, I kind of knew better. Um, but, yeah, so there, there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of drawbacks to the traditional um, business. Um, but... As far as the open source, uh, I think I think it does need the profit motive. It, I think, like I, I've I've listened to some of your your uh, conversations, and and I, I do agree that there's there's definitely some downsides sides to uh, competition, uh, you know, greed, uh, people being naive or, or uh, ignorant to, to how things work, disconnection with community with the things that you use. I agree with all of that. But I think that incentives to, to improve your product, to give products that your customers want, um, to invest your time and money into creating those products, to, uh, to keeping your know-how so that the free riders don't come along and take, take your product um, yeah, the risk of investing, all those things. I I think you need to have that that profit incentive. Yeah, open source is not is it just a development methodology. It's profit can be there or not. Yeah, so wouldn't conflate the two. Like, <clears throat> yeah, that longer discussion. But uh, I agree with a yeah. lot of your stuff. I don't agree with the free rider being a problem. It's not a problem. 
people want to free ride, they can free ride. It's like, otherwise we get into a very negative, my, my basic opinion on that is it's like, um, oh, I mean, uh, of course I'm biased towards, towards the complete open collaboration. I think that is, that is the thing to solve for. Collaboration, open collaboration. We're not trying to solve for accounting. We're trying to solve for collaboration. So it's a different, uh, kind of a different perspective. Um, to summarize that, it's like, if we can get enough people to show up, which we can't, I mean, right now nobody solved that. Uh, how do you solve it? We're trying to solve it. Uh, it's not going to be by hiding anything. It's it, that leads down the whole path of what we have today. So we're just saying, okay, well, how do we how do we simply create abundance and not not talking like hippie abundance, talking about real real productivity, real productivity on a small scale that's efficient and effective, and everyone can contribute to it. So a, a whole paradigm shift. But the thing thing we think about a lot is. That paradigm shift is in collaboration itself, as in that is the block. We can work on all kinds of funky mechanisms to account for contributions, this or that. And I see many projects do that, like, for example, Open Sensorica does it. Um, many times people that come here, they're like, oh, how do we account for contributions so we can get rewarded? No, all you need to do is collaborate openly. The, the rewards come from working together to make better, faster, stronger. And unfortunately, we don't have a, we can't say that right now because there is no track record of something like that. The closest perhaps was the 3D printer rep wrap. But that's, that's the problem we're trying to solve for. How do you get enough people to show up? And right now with us, like in the framework of the CD go home, absolutely transparent and open, inviting more and more people, selling a product that works and breaks through all kinds of economic limits. And that, that is the actual reward um, it's a very hard sell, though, because um, like yourself, you know, you, you're you're representing certain notions of okay, how how do we solve this problem? Um, unless we start talking about open collaborative, like not not open source, because most open source is not collaborative. Um, once we start talking open source and collaborative, we've got it. But if first thing we talk about is there's there's got to be that level of collaborative literacy, which is. Uh, that thing that's missing that's a cultural paradigm shift so not, not an easy sell but the way we believe in it is okay we'll just show something that blows the blows the world open in terms of economic success and then people might start noticing so that's kind of how we look at it um and the city home is then, actually our the thing that we're trying to say okay yeah this is it. everyone wants a house right it's open it will be one half to one third the cost of industry standards uh, maybe we can get some traction that way. That's that's where we're at. Okay. Yeah, cause at, at least with the rep wrap, um, it's my understanding that they're making money by um, producing the printer themselves. That, yeah, it's open source, but um, there's still a, a decent amount of know-how. Um, at least it, at the beginning, it was still kind of difficult to, to build something. Um, like what they can produce. And so it, those people who aren't willing to spend the time to learn how to do it are buying um, the rep wraps you know, from Prusa. Economics are right, simple. Think, it's like you sell a product, nobody's going to make it. The, the, the facts about open source is there's going to be hardcore developers, 99.9% .9 are users. So the kinds of arguments that say, oh, like everybody's in, I mean, that's, that's what we thought. Like first in 2008 when we did the CEB press, I thought, oh, can I release this? This is gonna make millions. We're gonna, we're gonna take the world over with it. No, not a single enterprise around it exists till today. We're actually aiming to change that by explicit entrepreneurial training, like making it super easy for people to do it. But the economics are very safe. It's like once again, it's it's just good old productivity. It's entrepreneurial savvy for on better products. That's the promise. Um, without the notions of, okay, we're going to just keep keep stuff to ourselves uh, or anything mm -hmm. like that. And uh, yeah. so think of the, the open sources. It's just a development method. And we all know that it's more efficient uh, in software that's, we've, that's been shown. In hardware, it has, and it's much harder in hardware because we have 200 years of industrial history that says you can't make a business without being proprietary. That started with a steam engine with the industrial revolution um, but it's very much alive today so nothing has changed on that in the last 200 years yeah yeah well i mean, I, I, I think um i'll tell you 
uh, more about the the two projects I was thinking about yeah. working on with, and and maybe uh, we could through working through it, um, yeah. maybe we, we could figure something out um, like a way a way to make it successful. Um, but but before that, I'm, I'm wondering maybe more general. Um, what what is your business model? Um, what what are the ways that you are making money or want want to make money? Business models are currently education workshops and product sales. We make things like CB presses, 3D printers, we sell them. No different than a regular business. It's the business model that and operates on being open. So, so, so in an open model, we're saying, yeah, we're actually training people to do this. In fact, to replicate the enterprises that we do. So we actually can train people if you want, we teach you right now how to start a business building the 3D printers, things like that. We call it distributive enterprise. So that's kind of a, a different model where it's it's in the grand economic theory, it's not about this um, redistributive economics that we live in. It's about distributive economics. That means not stealing and thieving in the first place, actually distributing the wealth of the world to people without having, uh, without resorting to redistributive means to try to make make up for that um, okay and, that and means, yeah we just just try to create products create and share productivity far and wide yeah yeah and I, I'm guessing uh, based on some of the things you talk about you know proprietary proprietary um, ownership you I'm guessing the education they need to pay for it um, all in advance yeah, um, you're not you're not like licensing the the name of, of your open source ecology to them to no. use for marketing. We are planning to do that though. We would like to license the OSC brand as if the the person who does that is distributive. So so that means if they carry on our mission, absolutely, we want to do that. We haven't done that yet. We do want okay. to license then, basically the open source products as distributive enterprise products which mean that you, you agree to, one, keep it open and contribute back to the development. So uh, once there's enough traction of enough people actually producing these things, then that, that mechanism starts to work. It's like an open source okay. practice. It's like McDonald's, except uh, all the IP is open so that anyone can participate. And we see that as a value proposition, not a, not a threat. Right. Yeah, that's... That's fine. Um, I guess it, if if they start using your name and uh, and uh, acting like they're they're licensing your product and they're not, then I suppose you'd still sue them. The uh, <clears throat> that's a possibility, though. We probably it depends. I mean, it's there's laws that <clears throat> that are available in the market, like trademark law. So yeah. uh, ideally, we never get in a position like that, but that may happen like once we get traction. But the thing to note is like <laughs> just just like one big picture that, that I want you to get your head around is if you do open source, you're not working on on trivial. Open source does not work for trivial goods. It works for solving pressing world issues, in my opinion, i.e. if you have a problem that's bigger than anyone can solve, you need to collaborate with others. So let's talk about problems like solve housing, solve energy, solve, solve poverty. So once you start talking about that, it's absolutely, <clears throat> in my, my view, it's like it's ridiculous if you're going to think that you're going to do it yourself as a proprietary company. You'll, you can scale maybe to billions, but we're talking about trillions. So, yeah. so open source yeah. is when you start talking about the trillion dollar scale economies. The, the, the reason why I asked that question was, uh, like, people use the name Prusa, and and it's not right. right? They 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 call it they call their printers RepRap, and they they have nothing to do with Prusa. You know, there's all these like, mostly Chinese knockoffs. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's yeah. I well, guess. Also, that actually, you know, I mean, I don't know if you know the other side of that, but at least for Arduino, it helps their sales. Because people buy the yeah. cheap stuff, and then they see, oh, it's a piece of junk, and then then Arduino gets more sales from people that would have never found out about Arduino. So it works both ways. Yeah. Too. My my point was, yeah. uh, if there are a bunch of 
companies knocking off your product, then it's it's almost impossible to sue them all. Yeah, but you know the the mind sh just just to reveal. Yeah, right, right, right. But can I share how my statement on that statement? Yeah, yeah. If Please. we're doing transformative world work, which is what the mission of our open source brand is, that would be like great. These people are solving pressing world issues. That's that's the way we look at it. Because I, it's not I, another thing I that would another thing I like about your idea is if you are you are probably producing it at a cheaper cost than anybody else could. And so why knock off somebody if there's not not much profit to to make? Yeah, but I mean not knock off but just make a living. I mean that's how we reframe that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, take knockoff, and it's like we, we don't look at it as knockoff. It's it's here's a person that gets a chance to build homes now because we, we open source that industry. Yeah. Which is good because that means that like, more likely than not, I mean, it's the typical story. Well, I don't know if it's typical because there's not enough precedent, but there's plenty of cases where, oh, the contributors who so-called knocked it off actually ended up ended up contributing to the... Uh, to the open core. Now that's actually, that actually has been, sh uh, now that I think about it, that actually has been shown very clearly. Because think about open software. Uh, before Linux was, <laughs> was a disease, the, the virus that would eat up all the profit. Now Microsoft is the number one supporter of open source, right? So we see that the people who, who you who knock it off first because I mean they all use open source they build upon it they may not admit it but initially they wouldn't admit it now of course it's cool to be open source but before when they would thieve the the software and, and make it proprietary like Gates um, mm -hmm. when he enclosed the commons on that on <laughs> his product um, at the end of the day he's the number one contributor so that I see as a precedent for hardware as well. So think about John yeah. Deere now. Okay, there's a common pool of open source tractor designs. People are collaborating. Companies like John Deere and Mahindra and Mahindra tractors are not all contributing to it and making a living based on that as well. Making a better product at the end yeah. of the day. That's the that's thing. Because uh, I'm not sure how, how much you know about, say, diesel engines, but... If you talk to someone who knows about diesel engines, they will tell you that there is no perfect diesel engine. Now, that's a fault of the, uh, that's an artifact, not a fault, uh, that's an artifact of proprietary development. Nobody ever got together to actually solve all the problems that all the diesel engines have. Like maybe one is better at this or another. It's a perfect example of, of the, the limits of, of proprietary development. And we think that kind of stuff goes away. You actually have a product that's like, bam, better, faster, stronger kind of deal so yeah has that been the, has that been the case for you though have your it, it seems to me that the open source uh, software even that I've I've used um, is has been harder to use um, there's like fluid dynamic software that I tried to use and it was yeah. just way too difficult it, it's like you have to be part of that community that to use it no, that's that's true, and no, it's it's not not the case for us either. We haven't scaled yet, but I would say that RepRap has shown it. I mean, the entire three D open, well, the pretty much the entire current desktop three D printer industry has been created by RepRap, so that is a case of better, fa faster, stronger. Even though the current companies, most of them went proprietary, so or went under or went proprietary, um, but as far as the when you refer to fluid dynamic software being harder, yes, and what's but that goes back um, to the issue that we're trying to solve for, and that is people showing up to develop. That that incentive, like if you have the clear profit motive, yeah, people will get paid and they'll sit captive developing the thing. Uh, here we haven't solved the open source. It's it's a long, long, slow walk kind of a thing. Um, until the point where revenue starts coming in from the product itself and starts feeding that product, just just the financial feedback loops, just like you can say that you can say the opposite about Linux. Linux runs all the web, right? So while it may not have reached that in com computational fluid dynamics, too small a problem. Backend of the internet, bigger problem, solved. 
See what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, so it has to get enough traction, enough, basically enough people. I, I always refer to it now as uh, we're solving for people showing up. Yes, once enough effort goes into that, it becomes a, a superior choice. It's just an obvious statement. Right. Uh, you're, you're a nuclear physicist, right? I guess you could say critical mass. <laughs> yeah, you can say critical mass, yeah. Though I left that um, for, for solar. Oh, okay. Or for solar. Um, yeah, so... I, um, when trying trying to uh, market technologies developed at the university, uh, um, companies don't want to to uh, spend a lot of money on R and D unless they are pretty sure they can recoup that money. Yeah. Um, this is this is at an extreme when it comes to like medicines, of course, uh, because FDA approval is averaging like a billion dollars mm -hmm. so they require a, a monopoly um, could the free rider problem with that is is very uh, real and very apparent uh, because if they spend a billion dollars and don't recoup that money you know somebody else can easily come in after FDA approval and start producing that drug um, mm -hmm. still they would need to get their own FDA approval but it'd be a lot easier at, the second time around Five ten Ks. Anyway, uh, a little a little less extreme uh, to that is just so somebody making an invention. If they don't have a patent on it, uh, a large company could come in and copy the invention. And simply by being larger and having more more resources, uh, they can produce the the product for cheaper uh, because economies of scale. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, the, yeah. they've already got their distribution, their marketing, their brand, um, and put put those small businesses out of business um, that are trying to make innovative products. I like what you're doing because um, companies don't have to spend as much money to develop that product, yeah. so there's less risk um, and less need for that monopoly to, to uh, make up for um, all the R and D money that they will have to, to spend, um, but I, there are just some industries that are super expensive. Uh, like at Intel, you know, a fab costs ten billion dollars, not including um, the equipment and materials and uh, engineering labor to to produce microchips. So I, I think that this this uh, makes sense. For some industries, um, and I'm, but I'm not, I'm not so sure, you know, all industries. Uh, you're absolutely right. If there's no innovation on the business model, but if you innovate on a business model, then this applies to any industry. So now think okay. about, for example, Fab, ten billion. Yeah. That's peanuts yeah. for a bunch of people. If you get a project of enough size to do it, then imagine that that the product then goes to benefit the people who, who went to develop it instead of shareholders. So it's just an innovation yeah. on the business model. It's, we're, if we're operating in the old business, business models, it doesn't work. Yeah, and, and that, that was kind of my point with the crowdsourced cooperative. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, I, I want to talk more specifically about your company. Um, so you're, you're making money by, by teaching people and then, um, so you're, you're Charging a, a tuition, and and then possibly you're you're going to make a percentage off of what they manufacture. It depends. We haven't done that. We haven't done that at this point. Right now. Okay. So most, right now we've most, been running workshops. Okay, mostly for tuition, and yeah. and the, the people who who come out of your program um, are are they likely to be manufacturing your products, or are they? going and teaching other people kind of like you are? It could be anything. I mean, we're too early in the game to do that because uh, to, to have much track record on it because what we do is hard stuff. It's very integrated. Uh, workshops take a lot of time to prepare, so only so far nobody else has replicated them. Uh, like, for example, to build a tractor in a, in a couple of days. Like, that takes a bit of skill. So we, ha we don't have any people that are outside of this facility that are doing that. We are working on that. Now... Uh, what's the point about 
um, revenue model to scale this? Well, I think the way it's going to work out is once the product sells, like for example, from the house, uh, we would be selling kits or turnkey builds. And as a nonprofit, we can do part of that as a nonprofit, as a, as a related business, if that's done within the framework of, of a training enterprise or start up a, a spin-off which focuses on just delivering the houses. Because at the end of the day, yeah, some of this economic traction has to happen. And that's why we think, so actually since COVID, we, we switched much more to the housing because we thought about, okay, what's a big problem to solve? And we're well positioned to, to do that with open source tools and designs to make it low cost. Down to crazy stuff, solar concrete, hydrogen production, not hydrogen production, not yet, but uh, solar con like even thinking about solar concrete. Oh yeah, sure, you, right now you, you can look at the numbers and if you notice that the PV cost has fallen down drastically, you can actually start start producing solar using just photovoltaic energy as the heat source. And people might think that's crazy, but if you look at the numbers, that's actually cost competitive right now. If you can do it uh, at a low cost. Industry can't do that right now at, at a low cost. Like for example, like we can do it. But um, there's a lot of opportunities that emerge from the open design when uh, you have access to the blueprints of how to do it. So you're not spending millions on, oh yeah, here we're developing and we actually got a lot of the technology in the open that, that allows us to do it at low cost. It's largely through integrated design. Largely, uh, a lot of businesses don't um, don't integrate the operation. It's, yeah. So, um, your your major goals are uh, to train more people, um, probably finish more of these. Uh, I think there's sixty different yeah fifty uh, machines you wanted to build. Yeah, 50 by 2028, uh, train people, yep. Uh, basically, we're looking at this place becoming a, pretty much a campus. So we're looking at, once we get to the point of thousands of people working on, on the tech full time, and, the, and open, open tech and open enterprise models, then we can start being noticed as, as something that's gain, gaining traction. Okay. Um, that, that seems like a lot. Uh, for you to because there is um, even even if uh, the community is kind of helping to design the equipment you're you're the one actually building it right you or your 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 people it's uh yeah so for us our I mean our next step in the game is to scale like a like a regular company so part of that is through scaling the the education operation and part is the production operation yeah. yeah. But then also new designs. But I mean, that's, that, those that's not going to change the world. That what's going to change the world is the fact that we're edu training people to do ex exactly that through two year. Um, initially, we started this six month apprenticeship that we have right now. We're looking more at like, so we're seeing like in the current cohort that, yeah, there's too much to learn in such a short time. So we're probably going to do more like the two, two year training for people to actually replicate the enterprises that, that we have. And uh, and so that's that is mostly funded by tuition, or are are they manufacturing uh, while they're a student or apprentice? Both. So there'll be both apprenticeship, plain education, and more apprenticeship style. Uh, right now, we're trying to uh, tap into the GI Bill because there's a there's a good resource right there, and also connecting to some socially conscious work there. So we're trying to do that. But think of a university, what's their revenue model, it's tuition. Uh, but we are adding the, the integrated aspect of whoever we're training, we're talking about, okay, let's, let's train you to not be an employee, but, but an entrepreneur. Here's how you do it. So that's, that's our preferred well, route. It's, it's a lot of grants, actually, for the university. Yeah. You know, over, I think we're over $125 million in grants Yeah. every year. Um, have you guys applied for, for grants? So we just started on SBIR, SDTR. This year we're kind of in process of it, but I don't know if that's something we can collaborate on as well, basically picking something that's relevant and 
and going forward with it. We haven't tapped it. We were just yeah. passing the grass the last decade prototyping things and seeing how these things work and, and just with amazing yeah. results, um, it's like next step. I guess you are not able to uh, apply for an SBIR since you're a nonprofit, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but you, you're, you could uh, be the PI for an STTR. Um, yeah, I mean we can we can start start an LLC or whatever if we got to do the SBR. That's that's the way we're looking at it right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, uh, yeah, that that's one of the things I'm I, uh, in helping the, uh, faculty at the university right. um, get SBIR uh, funding. Um, let's see. Um, so. I think that I'm kind of wondering if there might be grants for for educating uh, people, so both to to you at like kind of at like a vocational school. Yeah, yeah. That's um, where we're going. I, I think. Yeah. Um, have you looked in the grants for that? Well, we're working on it. So we're working with a person who's actually creating the helping us get the GI Bill certification. So actually, what's it, what's it take to get approved curriculum for both tech school and more tech school like? Okay, here's yeah. welding. Here's here's carpentry. Yeah, I was going to. I was going to say um, you probably need to get accredited by some some organization, some accrediting organization, um, to 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 qualify for yeah you, a grant like that. Right, you can be either accredited or unaccredited to tap into that. You have to be in operation and have a, a curriculum, be approved to operate by... Yeah. By the well, and then the other thing was um, showing uh, that your your students get jobs yeah. uh, in the industry that, that, you, that you certified them in. Yep. Um, so, so that's, uh, I think there's probably some funds like through the Commerce Department. Um, there are also um, National Science Foundation funds for um, new ways to teach people STEM. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it wouldn't be recurring funding. It would be like a one-time thing, but you know, to, to build your curriculum. Yeah, I mean, can we collaborate on that? Can you help us do that? So right now, I right. um, mentioned Jesse Bowden, but, but that's the contact at the UMKC. Um, okay, yeah, us. I think I think your small business development center is uh, out of Northwest, uh, Northwest, or, is it Northwest State University. Um, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, we, we can talk to, I'll talk to uh, the SBDC people, yeah. and they can probably help you with, with that. They have grant writers. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So the the other thing was kind of like your GI Bill. Um, once you do get an accredited institution, then there might be federal funding uh, to help students pay for their tuition. Of course. Yeah. Uh, and then, have you have you looked into uh, what is it called? Uh, the USAID, US Agency for International Development. So it's. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we haven't done any grant writing, as, as I mentioned. Uh, so this is new to us. So we haven't pursued any of these. I mean, there's tons of options, but but our choice was yeah. either spend that writing grants or doing real right. development. So we were pretty much bootstrapped the whole time. Just it's a it's a lot of work. I mean, the the SBAR they they. They think is like average 150 hours, and that, it, depending on which agency you're, you're going through. Um, but yeah, I think this could help developing countries. So um, I, I would think that there should be some money in that as well. I'm I'm fine with if you if you uh, give me the permission, I will go and contact these companies for you. I didn't want to do it without you being okay with it. But yeah, I. I can uh, I can contact a, a, a good way to figure out which agency would be willing to fund you. Uh, it's just to go contact the program manager, um, shoot them an email or even call them, and just you know I can send your TED talk and and they might 
if they're not the ones that would fund you, they might know who would, mm -hmm. you know, and send you, send you to the right person. I think there's a lot of different ways that you could, you could get funding. Um, uh, so then, as far as uh, the inventions I'm, uh, I've been pursuing that I, I think you might be interested in. Um, Tell me about the welder thing. You, yeah, so the idea on that is uh, 3D printing with a wire welder. Um, I think it's called WAM, uh, Wire Arc Additive Manufacturing. Yeah. Um, it's it's uh, actually building a prototype this summer. So we've got the Summer X program. We're going to build one of those. Um, oh, okay. Large yeah. So I. Yeah, I uh, I took a a Bob's CNC. It's this um, you know kind of inexpensive CNC. They're made out of wood for the most part, and uh, they're actually down in Springfield, around the Springfield, Missouri area, and uh, I I attached a, a welder to it. Actually, I might have photos that I can show yeah. you. Yeah, what, what software did you use to control it? Uh, it like, um, got all, it's all Marlin. Control? Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. I mean, that's the same thing we're doing. So we've got auto gas control and all that. Um, I do not actually have auto gas control. I, I, uh, uh, so I bought a really cheap uh, flux core. Yeah. Uh, MIG, MIG welder, yep. uh, so no gas, and just because it, they were very cheap, you know, you're talking $125 yep. is what I yeah. spent on it, um, and I, I tried 3D printing with that, and How it didn't you? work well, but flux course is, is nasty stuff, it yeah, yeah. went all over the place. Yeah, yeah, that's, that'll be, you'd have to go like so super I, slow on that one, and that'll probably overheat pretty but, quick. Yeah, so then I, I punched a hole through the nozzle and uh, routed some um, 7525 argon CO2 to it. Um, I, I switched to a, uh, a, different, a different driver board, uh, one that has six drivers. Uh, I can get you the name. I, so... Big Tree Tech, Big Tree Tech SKR. So, do you have any documentation on the overall system here, or if some um, any files or documents on the design, or not really? I could send you the photos, um, and I could send you the. the yeah. uh, you know, I'm trying to log into my Google Photos right now. Um, why I can't. Yeah, I mean, we're doing a three-day workshop on a on a Wham 3D printer, full metal 3D printer. Oh, great! Yeah, so it's coming up October fourth through the sixth. I'm in the wrong account. That's why. Yeah, it's kind of low-hanging fruit because we we know how to build large frames, all steel, and the universal access system that we have. Uh, it's pretty much low-hanging fruit for us to do that. Yeah. We've done some prototypes. Let me send you the what we've done or the latest one that we have, which is um, it's called D3D CNC torch table. Well, well, no, this sorry, this we ne not with the welder. This this is what we actually did for um, not on Wham, but the CNC torch table route. Okay, so here's a picture of it. Um, I'll share real quick. Right. Uh, so you can see, yeah, really uh, rudimentary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually didn't have to put this um, stepper to drive the, the torch head up and down. Um, realized that the nozzle um, since, since it's sticking above maybe, you know, nine, eight millimeters above the weld surface, um, uh, you can you can weld and 
so, he, so here's the idea. Here's the, the invention. Not only do you 3D print with uh, a welder, but then you come in and clean up your welds with a router. Yeah. Right? Because WAM is, is really ugly. Um, bad resolution, right? And and as you get more and more layers, the uh, if you have a little bulge, well, that bulge gets um, increased every single time because it's closer to the the nozzle. Uh, so any imperfections get magnified. So the idea is to come uh, every single layer and planarize, right? And and then also go in and clean up uh, just the outside. So the idea is um, you're not spending a bunch of time removing a bunch of material uh, because if there's only a little bit of uh, material that you're removing. So your your feeds and speeds can be very low, but it doesn't matter because you're not removing much material. Yeah. Um, let me show you an, another picture. Yeah. Sorry, I actually got to get going out because we're still we're still actually doing some work, finishing up some work right now. But so I kind of got to start wrapping up. But um, yeah, to follow up. Yeah, I mean that, that looks pretty cool already. No, this, this is pretty ugly. This was before shielding gas, or right. well, no, I guess I do have shielding gas. Oh, pretty ugly. Show though. something. Um, yeah. Depends what you want to do. Like if you want to do bulk objects, which which is what we want to do is yeah. Like for example, yeah. a large drive sprocket for for uh, tracks on a bulldozer, and that at that point you're like, oh, okay, that actually is relevant, even if you right. You only need high resolution in in, uh, in certain places, right? Yeah, yeah. But to follow up on, so what do you think is the most, um, you know, in terms of potential collaboration, like? Uh, or SBIR grants. Is there what would it look like to actually hire somebody to to collaborate with us to run with one? Because I mean, we've got so many different things we can do that on, uh, from aquaponics to the housing to the machines, renewable energy. Uh, well, it's it's machines. really it's it's really what is the most innovative product? Uh, there, it's it's highly competitive. Like NSF, you're most likely going to go through NSF. That's you know, in 2016, 15 or 16 percent of projects got funded for right. phase one. Um, they want to see the most innovative technologies, the ones that are going to have the biggest impact on people. Mm -hmm. um, and then they, it's also the ones that you have the most, uh, the ones that they believe are going to be successful, or so, sorry, that, that you have experience, that you have the, the capabilities. Um, also, if the innovation's already occurred, if you already built it, they're not going to fund it, right? They, it needs to be a new, a new product, new innovation. Is there something that, where, or do you know if we wanted to hire somebody to help us do this? What would it cost? Do people do that, or that's something you pretty much got to do on your own? Uh, to actually make it? No, to to write the grant. Oh, no, SBDC will do it for free. They have grant writers that will that will do the grant for free. SBDC? Sorry, who is that? Small Business Development Center. Uh, at Mizzou, is that? Or uh, you have, so that's what I was telling you, the Northwest, you know, like, like, I forget what the name of the school is. There's like Northwest State University. Right, right. Uh, your DeKalb County is part of them. So they, they would do your grant writing. Um, if they don't have a grant writer, then uh, we have one it, local um, that, that does SB, or, yeah, SBIRs, that, that SDTRs. That service is for free. That's the first time I heard, I heard, I'm hearing that. Yeah. Yeah, it's free. Um, do I have to be part of the university or? No. It's for anyone? Small Business Development Center is, is for Missouri citizens. Okay, uh, and I, I could help. I could help with that too. Yeah. Um, I could help you uh, put together and NSF. It's kind of nice. They have uh, it's a short, a short uh, form, mm -hmm. and then you can get feedback really quick. I mean, they they want to have feedback within three weeks whether or not you should submit a full proposal, and then the, the full proposal is a, a decent amount of work. 
Oh, well, that's that's interesting. I see one uh, Northwest Missouri State U, which is Maryville, which is about an hour from. Yes. Us. Yes, that that would be. That's oh. it. That, that's your so SPDC. We can go to them and, and they would help us. They actually all allocate a grant writer t to us. Yes. Um, well, that's news to me. I'd love to see that. Well, at, at least that is what they have told me uh, that they will help our faculty do it, and and they will help just other people do it. Um, around here, they mostly work with faculty, I think. Okay, well, because we that's who's making. Yeah, well, we definitely want to reach out to them, and yeah, if you can help us with that connection. That yeah, no, I so my my mother-in-law has a weekly meeting with all of the SBDC. Yeah directors so um, I'll, I'll bring uh, I'll just inject myself into their meeting and yeah. and bring up bring up your uh, your, your company uh, but you being you being a nonprofit uh, that you know you, it would have to be an STTR um, yeah no it's fine we can set up the the for-profit branch, we were going to do that for the purpose of the SBIR. Yeah, okay, anyway, yeah, so. I think that, that makes the most sense, yeah. Yeah. Then you can apply for an SBIR. Um, yeah. But, yeah, and then I'll, I'll also ask them about other, you know, other ways of getting funding, to fund yeah. you as a school, to, yeah. fund, to fund students going to your school, and then if you, if you get into doing international um, helping uh, developing countries, I think there's a decent amount of funding oh, there, absolutely. probably. Yeah, I mean, we're at a uh, place where it's like, yeah, I mean, we can do a million things. It's like, where's where to prioritize and who can actually help us do some of this stuff? Yeah, I think uh, the the WAM uh, would be one. Um, yeah. So, what would like? Okay, especially so with the building one. with the cleaning it up with the router. You know, I think that is. Um, fairly innovative, you know. There's no product you can't buy a product like that right now. You can't. I, th I thought I've seen that before. There are companies that that have made one, made them. Uh, there's one a guy in Colorado that has a company um, does not sell them. Okay. They just print stuff for as a manufacturing oh, okay. business. Yeah. Well, so, but right now, nobody sells them. We can knock it out of the ballpark. We've got the axis, motion systems, and controls that we can do this relatively easily at any scale. I mean, we can okay. scale the... And I, you know, you live less than three hours away. Um, I could bring mine to you. Um, I'm kind of... That'll be in interesting, a, yeah. Bring it on. I'm at a point where I'm kind of... I my So when I went to machine the metal, um, I'm just using those... Uh, rubber belts, pul uh, pulleys, and uh, NEMA 17, pretty weak motors. Um, so it, when it, it started machine, it, it pulled it out of, uh, like it, it moved, it moved the, 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 yeah, the motors, yeah. skipped. So anyway, um, I need to change to, a, I want to change to a, a, a chain, a chain drive. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> larger NEMA, NEMA 23s. Okay, yeah. um, I have all that. I just haven't gotten around to actually installing it. Well, if you want a three-day immersion in that, we're doing that October. So we've got, I mean, a bunch of people are going to be here. Or in the next two weeks, we're actually going to, right now we've been doing a lot of work on a house, but we're switching over to the CNC machines actually on Monday. So we're going to be breaking out the larger stepper motors and building upon the large axes. So we've got a bunch of larger axes here that we've already used and can use. So yeah, I mean, if you want to come on down one of these days and, and uh, collaborate on it. We're actually, we're actually, just today I was looking at chain, a little bit larger, a hundred chain for driving some heavier machines, but same thing. We're thinking about the universal axis that has some of the larger drive systems with chain is an easy thing. Even with actually like, if <laughs> we're actually looking at Here's a hundred weight chain, which is five thousand pound working strength, and we're gonna do three D printed sprockets for it because that you can still get a few thousand pounds out of that in terms of kinds of forces you can pull with if you're using a chain because the 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 force is spread over all of the sprockets. It's actually an effective way to combine with three D printing. 
Um, 3D printed sprockets, like sure. plastic? Sure. Oh, wow. You're talking about a uh, hundred weight chain has rollers that are like 0 0.75, three quarter inch roller height. That's a lot of meat. One mm -hmm. tooth, one plastic tooth can almost get you like a thousand pounds. If you talk about that kind of bulk. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, but so, is, the, is the tooth going to wear out really quick? Well, if you run it way under its specification, then it can last as long as you like. Especially if you print with high-performance plastics like nylon or, or polycarbonate or some, or um, Delrin, things like that. These, that's why yeah. we, we're saying we're, we need the higher temperature printers to do that yeah. very reliably and make it work. But... Just so I, I'm, I'm really excited about 3D printing and metal with really high tolerances for very cheap um, because I, I see all these 3D uh, modeling software that's become even free, yeah. um, like Onshape and FreeCAD. Actually, we've got a guy at our makerspace that is a big contributor to FreeCAD. Uh, Brad? If you could do that. Um, what? Yeah, Brad, right? That, that is Brad Collette. Yeah, uh, yeah, Brad. Yeah, you know him. Okay, cool. Yeah, he, he he made some three D printer parts for us actually with his. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, CNC. I, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I uh, I met him a couple times. Um, I might try to see if anybody wants to maybe make a, a visit to your your your, uh, your farm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bring yeah. The, the thing I, interesting to to meet him. Uh, yeah, I, t yeah. I never actually met him in person yet. He wanted to come down once, but we weren't available. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm excited about it because um, you know everybody says uh, you know we need we need to put tariffs on manufacturing uh, coming in from China, and, um, and that's that's only making products more expensive. Yeah, and the the problem is is uh, is is not the cheap parts. From China, it's that it, it, to manufacture. Uh, manufacturing is too expensive. You know, it's not that it's too cheap; it's too expensive. You know, it's, uh, it's if we could if we could get people producing products here, like buying kind of like the three D printer, you can now manufacture and prototype your own product. I, I I'm really excited about that. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. We're bringing it back within the next few years. Um, I just wanted to really quickly show you the uh, the uh, wind turbine. Um, it, um, so you can see these. It's got these flaps. Yep. Uh, it's really hard to see in this, but if the wind is blowing towards it. It actually closes those flaps, um, and then, and then as it spins around, it opens those flaps. Well, this is not a very good prototype because it's so small For that, um, yeah. So it's so small that the uh, moment of inertia is uh, too small, and so it, it yeah, or yeah, uh, too large actually. It, it won't, it won't, it won't open up in time. If this was a very large. Uh, prototype, then it would be spinning slower, and it would have time to open and close. Uh, yeah, we'd like but, to build a but I wasn't going to invest a bunch of money into producing a prototype that would actually work, right? Yeah, we were going to do one of those vertical axis wind turbine. We've got a design for 5K, 50 kilowatts using hydraulics, actually using a hydraulic motor on top, using some of the parts that we use already in the tractor. That kind of stuff. So yeah, large, larger scale, yeah. 50 kilowatt. Um, yeah, um, that I think might also be one that uh, SBIR would fund. Well, okay, uh, so it let's is do let's do the SBIR on um, on a on a WAM. Are you are you okay if that's open source? Yeah. Yeah, if we want to call no, it, that would be awesome. I mean, that's, there, that's part of our larger 3D printer infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I am interested in um, you know the profit capabilities, um, but 
Sure, let's do yeah, it. I mean, we're not I, for I, profit, I, but we're also not for loss, as I heard from somebody right. else. Right, right. Okay, um, yeah, I'll, uh, um, I'll talk to the SBDC about yeah, getting yeah. some grant writers and help. Yeah, and, uh, come on. And then I, I'll need to get like bio sketches from um, whoever is actually going to be doing the work. The leadership um, team. They, they want to know. Yeah, the team like they want to know. They want to have evidence that you're capable of actually building the things. I think I think you've got a pretty good resume already, so I think you have a good chance. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Okay. Well, I got to get running here. We're, we're actually yeah. Back out of it. Yeah, it's great. it's great talking to you. I'll uh, let I'll, I'll I'll find out that some information and, and set up another meeting with you. And tell you what I know. Excellent, excellent. Okay, Adam. Well, great. Thanks so much. Take nice care. talking to you. Take care.